You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Life is not easy. Life isn't fair. It never was, and it never will be. A good life takes grit, because the best things in life come from hard work, sacrifice, resolve, determination, and perseverance. Because grit means never quitting. It means coming back time and time again until you succeed. So on this show, we talk hunting, we talk outdoors, we talk conservation, we talk family, and life. We talk fitness, and we talk strength, strength of body, strength of mind, and strength of character. Prioritize who you are and who you want to be. Get gritty, because life isn't fair, and a little grit can make all the difference. All right, here we go. All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. We're coming at you from the studio, the half-finished studio. How cool is this? It looks awesome. I love it. I love it. I was at uh, lunch with my wife, and I'm like, I want an office like this. <laughs> like my my uh, my studio. I'm using quotations here. Is uh, in my basement in yeah. the guest bedroom of my house. Nice. So we just pulled the bed out of there. So I got the bed out of there, and uh, but it doesn't look like this. It will one day, but it doesn't right now. Well, folks, I am here with Ryan Mickler, and uh, Ryan, you have the Order of Man podcast. Yeah. And we're going to get to know you today on this show. Uh, you know, I started out in the basement in my, my old house, Gritty. Did you really? Yeah, I started yeah. out in the basement. We all, you know, it's Dude, I cool loved to start there. my basement. It was mine. It was all concrete everywhere. Yeah. There was a toilet. Oh, so like the echo and... Oh, yeah. I'm sure it was brutal. But, but for... these headphones, like, this is why I started with Did this Did you use these in the, down there? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Because, so it wouldn't be so bad. Because uh, it worked really well. Yeah. But there was a toilet, like... There's no door. It just <laughs> sat there in the wide open. I love humble beginnings though. Yeah. Like it's because I think I think there's like this misconception that everything needs to be perfect before you launch. Right. Right. Like I, I can't I can't release the podcast until it's just right and I have all the marketing and I have the right equipment. And and I get it. You want to get to that point as quickly as possible. But man, just launch. Like get something yep. going. Absolutely, dude. I I just I, I same thing went through my mind. Like I could sit here and in fact I didn't have any equipment. I had a video camera mm-hmm. and I was at the Northwest hunting expo okay, yeah. uh, uh, in Portland, Oregon. And Aaron Snyder was there from Kafaru and I had a Kafaru pack, but I wasn't sure it was fitting me right. It's a little, you know, it's like, I don't know enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, I go down there, Aaron and I start talking and I'm like, dude, and then he starts to answer all my backpacking questions, my boot questions. My, like, hold on, we got to record this. My, and I'm like, Hey dude, you want to just do a podcast? Yeah. And he's like, Sure, you got a podcast, and I'm like, uh, you'll be my first guest. Oh, you hadn't had one at that point. No. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> and I so, love it. And he he agreed. He he's he's a big fan of the underdog, mm-hmm. Aaron Snyder. Uh, and um, and so he's like, well, I'll help a brother so out. The podcast was born. And so it was born. That's cool. That's so. really cool. I did the same thing. I actually the the previous podcast that I had. This isn't my first podcast. Um, I, I, I'm a financial advisor by trade. And so I was trying to think about new ways to market my financial planning practice. And I'd been mm-hmm. listening to podcasts and I liked him. I enjoyed it. And I thought, man, maybe I just have conversations with experts on financial topics. Right. And I did like 20 episodes and really, really noticed that I love the medium, but I just, I didn't want to talk about the same thing I've been talking about for the past 10 years. So yeah. I shifted after about 20 episodes to what we're doing now. Yeah. And so tell me about that. What is the order of man? So podcast. Order of Man, yeah, it's a podcast, it's a blog, a movement, frankly, to help men become better men. So it's my goal to give the guys that listen, even myself, I mean, I've noticed uh, just a ton of benefit for me, but giving us the tools, the conversations, the resources, the guidance, the direction that we need to be better fathers, husbands, community leaders, business owners, every way that we step up as men, uh, it's my job to help facilitate that and bring great guests on like yourself. We just did a podcast for my podcast with you on it earlier. Yeah. And uh, and give these guys some conversations they need that'll help improve their lives. And how long have you been going now? 
three and a half years. We started this podcast in March of 2015. So I think about the same time that you guys have. Yeah, yeah. about the same time. Yeah, and it's been it's been a really cool. Ra- I started it as a hobby. You know, like I said, I was in that financial planning practice, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love the medium, and I and I told my wife, I'm like, I, I think I'm gonna do this instead. She's like, what? <laughs> and everybody I told was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And I and I did it, and I did it, and I did it. Three four months into it, um, my wife and I were talking, and it's like. You know, you're taking more time away from the financial planning practice and you're doing this a little more. So uh, I, I realized pretty quickly I was onto something here. And why why the order of man? Like Yeah, for me, why like yeah, why would what I was the impetus behind all yeah, this and this yeah. movement and this drive to do it like to do this particular topic. I subject. know it sounds so cliche mm-hmm. and, and and even I'm hesitant to even say it, but I feel like my entire life has led up to this movement. Mm -hmm. that I'm part of right now. Um, I grew up without a dad in my house and my mom did a great job raising me and my sister, but you know, there's only so much she was able to do with, with trying to raise a a boy into a man, you know? Yeah. She had enough insight that she got me involved in scouts and competitive sports. And I joined the military and I got a lot of exposure and experience that, uh, that way to other men. Um, but then, then I got married and started having kids and man, I floundered. I I just had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. And I just felt Mm -hmm. like a, like a duck out of water. I was so out of place and awkward. And my wife and I actually went through some struggles in our marriage. We, we went through a separation at one point and for a long time, I blamed her for the separation we went through and you met my wife yeah. this morning, but she's um, pretty awesome. She's amazing. She's amazing. And I, and I blamed her, you know, how, how could she do this? Why was she disloyal? Yeah. You know, why wasn't she doing the things that a quote unquote good wife should do? And, um, I realized pretty quickly that it was, not entirely my fault. I mean, it's a mm-hmm. relationship it takes two to tango, but, uh, I wasn't taking any responsibility for, for what was happening in our relationship. I was so focused on the business, which frankly wasn't going well at the time. And I wasn't giving her the time and the attention that, uh, that she needed. And I felt like I committed to giving her. And so we went through a separation, but it wasn't really until I took responsibility for my own actions in my own life and started focusing on myself as opposed to her. Cause what I was, was doing during our separation is how could I get her to change, right? Like if she only, she would do this and she would think this and say so, this yeah. and behave this way, right? Then the relationship would be good. would be golden. Right. If she if would she just would figure do things out. Exactly. She fix her stuff. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'll, I'll obviously that all that did was drive common, a wedge. That's a common of thread in our society today. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's never fun to look in the mirror and say, you're inadequate. Mm -hmm. And that's what I had to do. I had to look in the mirror and I had to say, you know what? You're not as great as you think you are. You're not as great in business. You're not as great as a husband or a father. And nobody wants to do that. How how, How did that day come about? Well, so I was, I was driving down the road. I remember the road I was on. I remember the cross street I was on. This is on during our separation. And I thought to myself for the first time in our separation that the marriage was over. Cause I always thought we could reconcile it up to that point. And, and for whatever reason, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I thought, man, this marriage is over. And if it's over and I didn't want to wrestle with that idea, but if it is over, I thought to myself, I'm going to be the greatest catch for the next woman to come into my life. Cause I'm young. Yeah. I knew that would happen. And from that moment on is really where I started to focus on myself. Cause I, I washed my hands of the relationship. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing I can do here. So I'm just going to fix me. Yeah. And so I did. And we can talk about maybe what that looks like, but, um, it was interesting because as I did that, it was like, it was like a flipping a switch on the wall. She responded to that because she saw, it. she's like, Oh, okay. Ryan's actually serious. He's doing different things. He's becoming a different person. And, and I think that's how how we build influence in, in anybody's life. Really? Mm -hmm. You know, you look at what I hear a lot of people say, Oh, I want to change the world and I want to grow this business and I want to do all these wonderful things. And yet they're not willing to turn around and face all that energy inward. That's how you build influence with other people. That's how you build credibility and trust by fixing yourself. And then people voluntarily decide to follow. Right. And, and that's, and that's what I did. And so to answer your question, um, I started to have these conversations with guys, like my friends, like what I was, they knew what I was going through. Mm -hmm. And the more I talked about it, guys were like, yeah, man, I went through a separation too. Or yeah, I didn't have a dad. And yeah, I'm struggling as a father. I'm struggling as a husband. I don't, I don't know what to do in business. So the more I started having these conversations, the more guys started talking about it. And I realized nobody's talking about it. Like all of us guys are going through the same thing and none of us are talking about it. So I'll talk about it. So that's what I did. Started the podcast and 
had some conversations with some cool people and it's grown to what it is today. So you and the wife reconciled. Yeah. Yeah. We were separated for about four months or so, maybe a little bit longer, Mm -hmm. but yeah, we reconciled. And, uh, this year we just celebrated 14 years of, of marriage and four kids later. And, you know, we still struggle, of course, from time right, to time. Right. It's marriage. Yeah. You know, she's got her own thoughts about how the way things work, and I've got my own thoughts, and um, she's stubborn. I'm stubborn, and but we make it work because we know how to communicate and we know how to work on ourselves. So you go through that whole experience, and so, you know, this, this order of man idea, it, you get to a point somewhere along the lines where what? You, dis- you realize that this is a problem in uh, society? This or- is a problem for me. Okay. And so quite honestly, I started it for selfish reasons because I had the podcast with a financial planning practice mm-hmm. and I thought, man, there's some people. And there was about three, four, five guys that specifically I wanted to have conversations with. Cause I'm like, I don't know how to run my business. I'm yeah. struggling with my business. I don't know how to like level up in my relationship. I don't know how to, how to maximize being a father, but, but these guys over here seem to have some things figured out. How can I have a conversation with them? Right. Like, well, I have this medium of podcasting why not just shift gears? Right. And so I started for selfish reasons, a hobby for me Mm -hmm. to talk with, with some cool guys who I thought had some things figured out. And as I had these conversations, but something had to be in it for them. Right. Right. So, so I said, I I've got this podcast and come join. You're you're telling my story here. I think anybody has gone through this knows. Yeah. yeah, It's like, I mean, it's really hard to get somebody that, that has, a vast amount of knowledge or experience that, and and they have succeeded in this space. Maybe it's bow hunting for elk, uh, whatever Whatever. it is. And I, you know, to be able to sit down and get that from them is a, is a huge, it's a big deal. Uh, I mean that you gotta, you gotta understand. I mean, their time's important. They can be spending it with with their audience or with their families or doing whatever it is they're doing. And by having a podcast, a microphone, first of all, where you put it on their head and you're like, okay, we're going to have a little conversation here, you and me, and we're going to go deep. Well, that also leads to, and then later you're like, but I'm going to share it with everybody who follows. Mm -hmm. And then they get something out of it too, because they're getting exposure. Their ideas are, are being shared and people go, you know, I like that guy. I'm going to go follow him that may not have heard of him or seen him before. It's a, it's a win-win for everybody. What do you think about this whole podcast platform and medium? It is so amazing. Uh, I didn't, I didn't really fully grasp how powerful it could be, but I mean, it's what brought us together. Yeah. That's the reason we're having this conversation. Uh, I'm amazed, you know, every day. And I know you, you as well, like every day we're getting messages from people who are inspired for me specifically with our audience. It's guys who are, are salvaging their marriages. Uh, they're, they're connecting with their kids. They're starting businesses. They're asking for promotions. And I get messages like that. And I'm like, man, this medium of podcasting has the ability to transform the world. And what I love about podcasting is that we can have a deep and meaningful conversation unlike any other form of media, I think in the past, you know, maybe yeah. radio a little bit, how it used to be before yeah. it was like inundated with ads because you'd see yeah. families together. I, I have people radio, come right? to me and say, how long do you think this podcast fad is going to last? It's not fad. And I'm like, guys, dude, h- how long has conversation been exactly. part of humanity? Mm-hmm. It's like, it's like people have been sitting around a campfire telling stories for hundreds of years, yes. thousands of years, tens of thousands, mm-hmm. millions of years, mm-hmm. right? So you sit down and this is the oldest form of of, of communication right. to sit down and tell a story, right? Like in front of a fire as the sun, as, as, as you know, as, as it gets dark and, and pass down that knowledge. Yeah, and- it's, it's just the oldest form of entertainment. Mm-hmm. You know what happened? That's a story, not only entertainment, but, but learning as well. Yeah. You know, we get entertained through story, which is why we cling to the words that are told in the story, but we also are informed, mm-hmm. you know, it's how you pass down. We, we had some hunting stories that we were sharing earlier. Not only is that entertaining, but it's also informative and educational so that now a new generation of potential hunters or those who are already hunting learn from you and they develop and grow their skills and they pass that on. This is not a fad. Now, podcasting itself, yeah, it it, it will eventually be replaced with some other medium or form of communication, but the spoken word is not going out of style anytime soon. What I like about it, you know, I've heard Rogan talk about this before. It's like long form communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't know what's going to come out, what tangent you're going to go off on, what nuggets going to be come about as a result of just a natural 
flowing conversation. You don't know. And so that's where, uh, it really shines to yeah. me. Cause if you sit down in front of a camera to do a film, you're, you're already, you're pre right, building the ideas. And, yeah. yeah. And then you're, you're delivering them, which is an art in itself, but completely different than this free, fro- free flowing communication. Like, the conversation is. I think we're just trying, I think we're just now hitting, hitting a stride with it too, because I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of them are like, you know, let me ask you the same 10 or 15 questions and we'll do a 25 minute conversation. And and that's how I started. Yeah. I just didn't feel like I was doing justice to that individual, having a conversation like that or myself yeah. or the people I'm trying to serve. Me too. I have a hard time listening to a podcast where it's, it's got preset questions. Right. Each and it's interesting to hear each person's it take is, on it. It is, but can you fit everybody into a certain for me? Series of questions? I can't do it. No. It's a, it's just there's a conversation. It's just hey, I'm going to get to know you and and bounce some ideas off you, and then yeah. from there, see where it leads. Right. So going back to you and and the wife and the and the break and the split there for a while, you talked about getting yourself in order, and it sounds a lot like what I've heard Jordan Peterson say. So. But then Peterson says, you know, clean your room. Yeah. Like clean your room. And before you go out and try to change the world, get yourself in order. Like that's the basic thing. Like take care of yourself, get your own self organized. And if you can't even keep your room clean, like if you can't keep your house in order, if you're not like doing some basic stuff, like paying your own bills, taking the trash out, (laughs) who are you to like tell the world how how it would be improved. And I, it's funny. Cause you talk about taking out the trash. I tell, I tell the guys that I, that I work a little bit with, I'm like, cause a lot of them will say, you know, Ryan, I'm, I'm starting this venture. And my wife doesn't trust me. It's like, dude, you can't even take the trash out when you say you will. <laughs> Amen. Like, why would she trust you with your, your financial livelihood? Right. Of course and, she doesn't trust you. And so when you focus on your own stuff, when you get, you know, you're taking the trash out and you can accomplish simple things like cleaning your room mm-hmm. and keeping things in order. Wow. It, 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 the, that in itself, like Jordan Peterson talks about, it's not a simple thing. It's a big freaking deal. Yeah. Being able to clean your room, get yourself in order. It's a big deal. It's a life changing deal. I mean, not only for you, but the people that you impact, you know, I think about, uh, my kids, for example, the more I fix myself, the more likely it is that they will be able to fix themselves and produce the kind of life that they want and in turn impact their communities and their potential and future kids and their yeah. grandkids. It's generational. So you talked about changing yourself. What did that look like? How did that come, come about? So there was a couple of facets of my life where I really recognized I needed some help. Number one was fitness. I was 50 pounds overweight. I was miserable. I was tired. I was exhausted. Energy levels were low. It was, it was bad. And I'd always been fairly athletic. I mean, I played sports, football, baseball, wrestled uh, in high school. And so I, I was fairly athletic, mm-hmm. but I just let myself go. Um, so that, that was one area. The other area was, was the business. I mean, I realized I'm really struggling with my financial planning practice. I don't know how to do this. I'm, I'm so arrogant that I just thought I could get it figured out. And what ended up happening is I got like this close to throwing in the towel because I wasn't making any money. I wasn't providing for myself, let alone for my family. So what I did specifically with regards to my business, and I'll tell you about fitness, uh, with my business, I noticed that there was two advisors in my office who are producing day in and day out, month in and month out, always on top of the leaderboard, always having new clients, always bringing in new assets and going on client appointments. And I'm like, I was so frustrated. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't understand how these guys are doing this and I can't do this. And, and one thing that's always so funny to me is I think inherently most of us recognize when we see somebody else succeeding, right? Like we look, Oh, he's doing good or he's doing, or she's doing good. And yet we fail to bridge the gap and the gap that bridging the gap means that we just extend ourselves and say, Hey, will you help me? And most people will like, that's what I found. Most people, <laughs> if you just ask Most people are willing to, not only are they willing, they want to, they want to share, they want to impart some of their wisdom. So I knew I was getting close to throwing in the towel. And instead of doing that, I said, I'm going to try like last ditch effort here. I'm just going to ask these two guys if they'll go to lunch with me. And they did. Yeah, I'll go to lunch with you. I bought them lunch, 10 bucks or whatever it was, Mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, 
just asked him some questions about the financial planning practice. Hey, how are you doing this? Yeah. How does it work? Like, it sounds a lot like, what are you saying? The first few times I asked somebody, like, I, I remember standing there in front of Cameron Haynes. I was like, um, yeah, so, uh, I do a podcast. Uh, in fact, my gear set up like a hundred yards over here around the corner <laughs> at this hunt expo. Um, you don't want to do one, do you? Like maybe sit down and do a podcast. And he's like, sure. Yeah. You're like, Oh, Oh, he said, I yes, I didn't anticipate that. <laughs> I was just going to walk up. <laughs> Isn't so, that funny? Yeah. I mean, and it's like that with like Corey Jacobson and others. I remember asking Corey about, you know, he just finished, I think his 10th, uh, elk calling championship. And I was oh, like, yeah. kill a lot of elk. And I'm like, I really want to talk to Corey. I want to know how he does what he does. I want to crack the code. I, mm-hmm. I want some secrets. I want some yeah. trade craft here. And I asked him and he's like, yeah, I'll sit down. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, it, it's amazing. And I think people do it to me now. They come to me sure. and they ask me questions. They're yeah. like, oh, he responded. No, they DM me on Instagram. It's like, but why oh. wouldn't, why wouldn't you? you I, know, I, like, think, I think I, there's some people that maybe are hard to reach or unattainable right. that way. But like for the most part, I think everybody's, yeah, like, I think you're, you'd decent. be surprised when you reach right. out what kind of, uh, who, how much of a response you can get. Yeah. I mean, I've had, so fairly new into the podcasting, this was probably, I don't know, five, six months or so, I, I reached out to Jocko. We talked about Jocko earlier mm-hmm. and he ended up coming on the show. He's been on the show a couple of times. He's coming on again. And, uh, I had a lot of people like, Oh, how'd you get Jocko? How'd you get Jocko? How'd you get Jocko on the show? I just, I tweeted like Jocko, will you come on my podcast? <laughs> and he wrote back, sure. Like, There's no secret. <laughs> like just put yourself out there. Yeah. You know, like if you recognize I, I am deficient in this area mm-hmm. that takes humility, of course. But I'm deficient in this area. So what you were talking about earlier is like, don't lie to yourself. Be be real with yourself. I'm not where I want to be with my business. Those guys are where I want to be. Mm-hmm. I'm going to bridge the gap by walking over there and opening my mouth and saying, will you help me? Now, the worst case scenario is they're going to say no. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that sucks. Dude, Just little people punch are to the ego, so but afraid of rejection. I know. It's crazy. So afraid of rejection. But but very rarely is that even going to happen. So these guys, these guys are like, yeah, we'll come. So I, I started getting trained by them, build up a, a relationship with them. I, I even started bringing them on client appointments. I'm like, hey, just, just come with me. Like, help me. So they came with me and I would split my, my revenue, my compensation with them, which I wasn't making a lot anyways. And I'm like, yeah. oh, now I'm going to have to split this with them. But I realized 100% of zero is still zero. So I'm like, <laughs> I got to make some money here. Right. I got to like pay the mortgage this oh, month. Oh, yeah. I've done that math myself. Uh, yeah. So I started bringing these guys on and – um you know, I learned their ways. I learned what they were doing. I learned what they were saying. I learned their work ethic and how, how they were making it work. And surprise, surprise, it started working and this business started. And I, in fact, just uh, last month I sold my financial planning practice, um, all because I was willing to drop the pride and go ask for some dang help. Well, that's what I was going to say. What was at the root of it? And I, I would say ego is oh, totally. and pride are at the heart of that. Like the reason that you don't ask for help, the reason that you can't learn. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think ego is, inhibits all learning, Absolutely. just blocks it, shuts it off. Yeah. So you, you can't learn how to run your business if, if your ego's just full steam ahead. Not only bit, I mean, any area of life, you know, I just picked up, uh, bow hunting. I was telling you the, the first time I shot a bow was December of 2016. Yeah. And I had a friend call me up. He's like, Hey, you want to go on a hunt? And I'm like, uh, like in my head, I'm like, I don't, I don't like, I don't know how to hunt. I've never been, I don't know what to do. Like, it'll be awkward. And I just said, yes. I'm like, yes, I, I want to do that. I'll do it. Yeah. Just yeah. say yes. And then I went into the bow shop and I felt dumb. I felt so dumb. I walked in there and like, all these guys have been doing this with their dads for 30 years or longer. And I walk in, I'm like, I need help with a bow. He's like, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what you tell me what I need Mm -hmm. and you just feel so dumb. And then, uh, uh, two months ago I started doing jujitsu and a buddy that's been doing it for a while. He's like, try, try jujitsu. I'm like, okay, yeah, sounds cool. I'll try it. And I walked in the first night and I felt so dumb You know, I felt awkward and uncomfortable and out of place. I'm like, I want to be here. I'm trying to like come up with all these little (laughs) excuses in my mind. I'm like, oh man, if only my wife would call and tell me like, like she's got a flat tire or something, <laughs> right. you know, like I'm trying to get out of this and you know, you throw yourself into the fire a little bit and you feel stupid and awkward and out of, out of place, but then, but then you do it and you're like, man, I feel good about that. You know, you start building up that confidence and then you try something that you previously thought was unattainable and you build up confidence there and, 
And you just keep doing that. And you say yes to the opportunities that present themselves. And yeah, they're uncomfortable and they're scary, but that's, that's cool. Like that's part of life. That's yeah. fun. There's a chapter in, uh, the four hour work week with Tim Ferriss where he talks about fear, a uh, whole section on it. Cause he's like, fear just stops people from mm-hmm. doing so much in life. Yeah. And most of that fear is in your head. It's un, it's really unwarranted, mm-hmm. you know? And he talks about walking into a Starbucks, right? And he's like, we just want you to start getting over fear. So we're going to have you walk in. Here's your fear challenge. And there's all these fear challenges mm-hmm. throughout and the book. And you walk in and you lay on the floor. You're in oh, line yeah. for a cup of coffee and you just lay on the floor in the middle. And then people ask you why you're not allowed to say why you're on the floor. You just got to say, I'm just, I'm just resting. <laughs> just, just yeah. laying here. And how many That's people awesome. just stare at you and are like, well, that dude's weird. Yeah. Or you come up and you're like, Hey, I know your coffee's like two bucks, but can I get it for a dollar fifty? That's the one. Ask for a discount. Discount. Yeah, that's and they're hard. Like, they're they're like, we can't give a discount. And you're supposed to argue for this discount, right? Come on, like if I do this, you know, why wouldn't you give me and, and you're like, please come on, and it's just awkward. Yeah, right? so uncomfortable. And what he wants you to do is go through these exercises because really you got nothing to lose. No way. You got nothing to lose. So you're laying on the floor. Big deal. Some people stare at you. thinks you're an idiot. You stay, okay, yeah, well, so thinks what? you're an idiot. But you're, it's amazing how many people are just, I could never do that. Mm-hmm. could never do Same that. Same thing with public speaking. Like no, like people won't go out and, because basically what you're doing when you go out to public speak, you're actually volunteering for people to criticize you. Absolutely. Right? Like you're saying, I'm going to stand up on an elevated stage mm-hmm. and you're going to sit there and you're going to critique the way I look. The things that I say, the way that I say it, I want you to critique all of that. Oh, talk about discomfort. It's like a live podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what I mean? It's, Except it's like- for there's no, there's no editing. <laughs> yeah. There's no like, oh man, if I lose my place, like Brian will jump in and save me. Like, no, it's you and yep. the people that are, are judging you at that It's point. funny. I've done quite a bit of that, you know, being, I was a seminary teacher for a couple oh, yeah, of years yeah. and teaching 15 year olds <laughs> and 16 year olds <laughs> in high school, the Bible. You know, yeah. like the Old Testament for 50 minutes. Yeah. Feels like an eternity. Yeah. And they're ruthless. And they're mean. Like they're like, they're all like football and cute girls. And they're like, they come in class and they got attitude. And they're trying to be and that the, way. Yeah. Like, and the last thing they want is to talk about the stupid Bible with <laughs> their teacher. Right. And it's like, <laughs> they're all too cool for school. You know, so my job is to actually make it an interesting topic. Yeah. Actually bring the stories to life, help them see why they're important or not, you know, and, and just kind of challenge them. And that was hard for 50 minutes every day, five days a week for, you know, an entire semester. Mm-hmm. And you walk in that door unprepared. Oh, they'll eat you alive. They're ready to eat you alive. Yeah. But I'm a dad, a full-time job. I got a life, I got other things. And, and so there wasn't always preparation. So I had to, I, I learned, you know, to take some pressure. And there were times where sometimes things just spiraled down the toilet. There were some epic failures. Mm-hmm. And I, I liken it to like on a much, this is a micro scale, but if you put it on a scale like Joe Rogan talks about doing comedy and stand up, oh. how many times did he just wet the bed oh, on the stage? Oh, just bomb. Just I'm bomb. Sure. And you like walk out like, whoa. That like, was- you know, where you like start feeling bad for the guy. Like, <laughs> yes. you know, it's bad when you're like, Oh, I feel bad for this dude. Right yeah. Now. Help him get feel, off. The yes. Stage. You're like, trying to rescue him. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, without those experiences, he wouldn't be the comedian he is now. Right. And, and I feel like without some of these experiences of speaking in front of these kids or I, when I did my old career, it governance compliance work, we do these audits and some of them were Sarbanes Oxley audits. Some of them were financial audits, revenue audits. And we, I would go in and talk to the CEO like the CEO at Nike and the CFO. Mm. And I'd be in the room telling him that his stuff's all messed up Yeah, and you got to fix it. Or I'm going to give you these, you know, negative marks and we're going to give you a qualified opinion and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, who are you? Yeah. What are you? 22? <laughs> right. Get the hell out Get of my out face. Of I'm, yeah. like, I'm sorry. These are the results of the audit. I mean, I, I didn't make them up. It's just how it is. Yeah. And this is what I suggest as a course of action. And, being under, you know, being fresh out of college and then telling somebody like that in that position, you know, what's going on. There was a lot of pressure and 
all of those things, putting yourself out there in those situations, all of those high pressure cooker type moments, they're what I think I say this all the time. 40 year old Brian succeeded at, at things that 30 year old Brian would have failed at mm -hmm. because I failed all failed the way 30, up. Right. Yeah. Up to a certain point. I think a lot of people dismiss it. Uh, and I've seen this quite a bit I, and I used to do this is dismiss another person's level of success as simply luck or fortunate. And, and it's such a dangerous trap to fall into. Like if I believe or start to believe in my own head that the only reason we'll use Joe Rogan because we we're talking about him is so successful as he was is because he just happens to be at the right place at the right time or he has a connection that I couldn't make or that he's, he's some sort of gifted that I could never develop. That is a huge, huge trap that you want to avoid because you discount all of the crap and the garbage and the work for decades yeah. that an individual like that has done to get him to where he is today. I, I, I am very, very cautious of discounting or writing people's success off yeah. as luck. You, you and I are the same. Like I always default to when someone says something, they discount mm -hmm. someone's mm -hmm. uh, success. Let's say their business is doing really well. And they're like, let's take President Trump, for example. It's like there's a whole subset of this country that's like, dude. Dude's just freaking lucky. Right. He's like, like, come on. He's the president of the United States because a bunch of stupid people voted for him. It's like, look, guys, <laughs> he didn't get to where he was by accident. No way. You can say whatever you want about, you know, anything about his character or personality. But at the end of the day, he is still the president of the United States. Right. You can say the same thing about Obama. You can hate him. You can do all these things. But you can't take – like the, by virtue of what he attained – there's something there. Well, and I believe in – There's I mean, some there's, skill there. There's there, something. Absolutely. And, there, and I mean let's be real. There's fortune too, right? Like, there is. Like if you're listening to this and you – well, just, if you're listening to this, you're to some degree – you're fortunate in your life. You're – Right? And absolutely. especially if you you live in a, and were born in this country, for example. Like you and I could have been born in any number of situations and environments. Right. And, and we weren't. We were born in the environment that we were. So there is fortune. Yes. No doubt. But if you take somebody who is who wins and thrives and succeeds over and over and over again, that supersedes just some fortunate event yeah. that they yeah. happen to fall into. I'm very like you. I'm very cautious about discounting their success just because I don't like them. Mm -hmm. It's like, wait a minute. There's uh, there's something there that made them capable. Right. That made them get to this point. And uh, I'm going to try to figure out. That's a great that. point. I think you bring, that's a really good point is like, okay, let's take Trump again. You don't like him. Okay. I, I can respect that. I mean, there's some elements where I'm like, ah. <laughs> what, what, geez, what did he smoke something? This morning? Yeah. Like, you know, where, yeah. where I, I don't fully respect or appreciate, <laughs> but at the same time, I, I'm going to like, there's some other elements yeah. that I'm like, I got, I can learn something here. Right. Exactly. Like I can learn something and apply it into my own life using my own moral standard. Mm -hmm. and enhance my life and the people that I feel like I'm, I'm supposed to be yeah. serving. Let's get back to this fear thing because uh, I, I think it's a big deal today. I, I, I hate to see people not take leaps and jumps toward things that are dreams and passions because they're afraid. Mm -hmm. How do you think someone overcomes that? So there's a question I get asked a lot and it's one that's reoccurring over and over again. And it's the, it's about emotions and especially with men, like how do I deal with my emotions? How do I deal with anger? How do I deal with fear? And I think what people are trying to do when they say that is dismiss it, right? Like how do I not be angry or how do I not be afraid? I don't think that's the right approach. I, I, our emotions that are, are, are there to serve us. Even what we would deem as the quote unquote negative ones like fear, like greed, like jealousy, like anger, all those are, our emotions are simply indicators that something's going on in our lives. So, so the best way to handle your emotions is to try to understand what it is they're trying to share, what it is they're trying to teach. Why are you angry? Okay, good. Do something different. So you're not angry next time. Why are you happy? Maybe consider doing that again. Cause that brought you joy. Why are you afraid? Well, I'm afraid because I don't have the confidence or I'm afraid because I could get injured. or I'm afraid because I could go bankrupt or yep. good. Play it all out. P play it out in your head, in your head. What's the worst? Like, so when I started order of man, I had a, a successful financial pl planning practice, residual income, 
Mm-hmm. We were making six figures. Family was well taken care of. And I walked away from the business. Yeah. You know, like even when I start, even when I was in the financial planning practice, I worked for another organization, a financial planning firm. And about five or six years into that, I started, I, I actually started my own financial planning practice. I walked away from a residual six figure income, but I didn't hide from the fear. I just said, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst that could happen is this doesn't work. Okay. Then what? Then I go back and I get another job. Yeah. See, that's what Tim Ferriss says too in the fear chapter in 4-Hour Work Week. I believe that's where it's at. It's like you go through this exercise and the exercise is write down the fear and the what, what's the worst that can happen. Mm-hmm. And when you actually map it out, instead of it being this obscure bo- boogeyman in your brain of, oh, I just couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. When you write down, okay, what's going to happen mm-hmm. if things just – the wheels fell off. Right. You go through it and you're like, oh, dude, I could totally live with that risk, yeah. actually. Like, or, it's or not, not that o- bad. Or not only live with it, just plan for it. Mm-hmm. So one of the things for, for me with the financial planning practice, I'm like, you know, this, this could take me six, six months to a year, maybe even longer, to build up income to the point that it was before. So I've got some time. Why don't I just build up that amount of money in savings and investments? Yeah. So that when I do make the transition, if it takes longer than anticipated, it's okay because I've got the cash reserves over here. Yeah. So a lot of people say things like, oh, fear, fear. It's just false evidence appearing real. It's it's real. (laughs) Like that's a real threat. So don't hide from it. Address it. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think how you overcome uh, the things that will typically hold you back. Stop running from it. Stop pretending it doesn't exist. Address it. Recognize it. Realize it. Plan accordingly. And then drive forward. Yeah. So back to you changing who you were, Mm -hmm. how did, so you met with these guys and you learned from them Yep. and you started to get your act together and you started to be successful. (laughs) You you adopted some humility. Yes. And, and then started to, to, to then grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, and what else did you do to grow as a person? The, uh, and I, and I go back to what I was saying earlier, the physical fitness component was huge for me. I mean, huge. I was eating like crap. Uh, there was a Burger King right across the street from my office. And so ah. I would, I would, I would go on my lunch break. I just walk over to Burger. I probably didn't even walk. Who am I kidding? I drove across <laughs> the street and went into Burger King and got the double Whopper playing with cheese, man. Yeah. And I would do that every day. And. I'd get home and I'd, I'd be tired. My kids would be like, let's play. And I'm like, oh, I can't. And Can then, I just ate like a whole bunch right. of like uh, chemically Poison. infested French fries. Exactly. And- <laughs> exactly. I remember my kids came to me and they said, well, my two, I had two boys at the time. And they said, dad, 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 let's go jump on the trampoline. And I remember looking at their eyes. And when I said, I'm sorry, guys, I can't. Like, I can't go jump on the, like, I literally couldn't. I was exhausted. I was beat. I just could not go jump on the trampoline. And that's the moment that it changed for me. And I was sitting, I remember I was sitting on a, uh, in our little hometown there, I was sitting, uh, on the sidewalk as the parade went by. Yeah. And this, uh, this gal who I had known for quite a while, I was walking by in the parade and she was handing out flyers and she handed a flyer to me and it was for, it was for a CrossFit gym. And I'm like, you know what? Like I need to do something. Like I was go to CrossFit. And so I did. And that was, that was roughly, it was like five years ago. Okay. So I went to this CrossFit gym and I mean, it completely turned my life around. And I remember my coach, his name's Josh Langston. He said, um, he said, I'm, I'm not here to make friends with you. Like we can be friendly, but I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to push you hard enough that you don't like me, but not so hard that you quit. And I was like, I like this guy. (laughs) Like I like this guy. And, uh, I, I transformed my fitness, man. I started eating better. Um, I started to, uh, obviously get in shape, lift weights and move and conditioning and everything else. Um, I started doing Spartan races, which was a, which is a big component of that. And what I realized is that everything that I needed to get myself in check regarding fitness was the exact same set of skills and discipline that I need to be successful on any other front. It's discipline, it's consistency, it's, it's, it's effort, it's, uh, living a strenuous life. Uh, it's doing things when you don't want to do it's, it's grittiness. Mm -hmm. It's all of those things. And guess what? If you want to be a better 
father or, or wife, or you want to be a better business owner, or you want to be a better mother, whatever, it's going to require all of those things. And it was amazing as I lost weight and got in shape, my energy levels increased, uh, my confidence in myself because I could look at myself in the mirror and feel confident with where I, uh, the, obviously, uh, the passion with my wife improved. Like any metric of life improves when you start getting yourself in shape. I mean, it was, mm -hmm. it was an incredible transformation. And I'm not going to say that over the past five years, it's been perfect, I've been up and down. And, um, you know, I like to eat all the chips and salsa that are in front of me, you know, like, so there's like temptations and of course, and sometimes I fall off the wagon a little bit, but I know how valuable it is. And every time I get back on, um, things are just better, man. Things are just better. What did you learn from, uh, like I've heard this before. I tell my kids this all the time that, that when you get in shape, it's like an antidepressant. Oh, hundred like percent exercise. They talk about when someone's suffering from depression, one mm -hmm. of the first things they do is say, well, you need to start going on a walk and you start lifting some heavy things. You need to go through some exercise. Yeah. And it's like overnight, there's a physiology to us. And when you start exercising, the body starts responding the way that it should, because we're meant to, to live a strenuous life. Move. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's why, yeah. And, and I, and I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know this, the science and the data and the research, but I just know how I feel. Yeah. Like I, I don't feel down. I don't feel lethargic. I don't feel like it. Now we talk about the trampoline, you know, with my kids is I can go on the trampoline with my kids and they'll get tired before I do. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's how it's supposed to be. I'm the leader. Yeah. Like they need to be following me. And if they're out front, then I'm not leading them. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. So then as you change your life, yeah, you know, uh, you come on the podcast and you start that thing. Yeah. Um, by the time you get to that, you've kind of figured some things out. A lot of things, not all the, th not all the things, but a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm still learning and still trying to be more efficient. And one thing I've noticed too, with the podcast is there's a lot of things that I just in talking with hyper successful people that, um, I didn't even realize we're on, we're beyond the scope of my capacity. Right. So we spend so much time in these little boxes and these constraints and limitations that we impose upon ourselves. That's mm -hmm. what's really interesting. We hear it from our parents, right? You, you, you hear it from school teachers, yep. Yep. like, like sit down, shut up, color within the lines. Here's the structure. Here's the systems. And while there's, there's importance in having structure and sy systems and, and, and moral codes and the ways that we operate, that's all important, mm -hmm. but it's also a limitation. And so we start imposing and putting up these walls, brick by brick by brick. We put up these walls around ourselves and then we just realize like, or, or we don't realize how much further we could go or what's beyond the walls. And the only way to do that is to recognize somebody that has expanded yeah. their, their perimeter, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what I noticed with the podcast. So I figured a lot of things out with regards to fitness, with regards to how to manage and run a business. Uh, communication was a huge, huge key for me. And then understanding that, th and this is the biggest one right here, that I have to take care of myself. And so what I was doing is I was giving all of my energy and attention to my wife and my kids and my boss and my clients. And guess what? All of that is noble. That's good. You should serve. We're supposed to serve other people. But if you can't serve yourself, you can only serve other people for so long. Right. So I figured that out. Um, and I started talking about this. Then I started talking with Navy SEALs mm -hmm. and the level that they're talking about yeah. with regards to their training and mental toughness. Then I started talking with extremely, extremely successful business owners and athletes and scholars and authors and it just has opened my eyes to this world of possibility that I didn't even know existed. That wasn't even on my radar before. It's amazing how much is out there. Yeah. I realized the more that you kind of that, that adage, the more that you, uh, the more that you know, mm -hmm. excuse me, the, the, the more that you learn, the more that you know, you don't know. Right. So I'm, I'm, yep. I butchered that, but you understand what I'm saying. Absolutely. It's pretty incredible. So let me ask you this, you know, you've been doing, how many episodes do you have? Uh, I think we're like, between, so we do two shows per week. Uh, and I think we, we title them different, but I think we're right around 310, yeah. 320, somewhere right in there. Okay. With, with those episodes, tell me which one, like someone's coming on for the, well, before I go there, like for you, mm -hmm. share with me like an episode that was the, where it was like 
wow, that blew my mind. That was for you. A show that just was one that stands out for you. Yeah. I mean, Jocko Willink is somebody who I admire and respect so much for what he's been able to do and how he operates his life. I mean, the guy is, he's robotic, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and for him to come on a couple of times and hear him talk about discipline and ownership, just amazing, amazing conversations with him. Um, another one that really stands out is, uh, his name is Dr. Robert Glover Mm -hmm. and he wrote a book called no more Mr. Nice guy. And the book, the premise of the book is that it's written specifically with men in mind, but I think it applies to women as well is that we spend a lot of our times trying to please other people, Yeah, which is not bad in and of itself, unless it comes at your own expense. And so there's so many guys out there who play like the nice guy Mm -hmm. and they get railroaded at every station in life. And man, that, if that wasn't me, I don't know what was I, I, that's interesting. Like I have no, no, I I don't have a lot of patience for that. Like, like there was a time though, where I want to please people. I want everyone to get along, Mm -hmm. you know, and, but I'm, I'm the kind of person that's, uh, very like, I, I'll, put up with quite a bit mm-hmm. for for a while like i'll be polite but firm i'll be but i'm polite like i i don't want to turn into a yelling match or yeah i mean or, you don't need to be a jerk right no and done. so but i'll let someone push me and push me and push me and push me and and i'll just gently put up that wall that just hit takes the push and takes the push and takes the push until you push too far mm-hmm. and then once it's gone too far i kind of cut you off. Mm -hmm. And I feel like before I get to that point though, I've, I've tried to be as, as, um, methodical and straightforward in, in my life, like in communication, like this is not working, you know, and I, I try to have good communication skills and we try to work through things, but there are some people that are just dominant, intense people. Right. Right. And they just, can't not push. <laughs> and for me, I'm like extremely stubborn as well. And so once you, once I get pushed too, it's just not working. Right. I'm like, I love you, but, but you're not part of this because I can't, I can't deal with the constant pushing. Yeah. Like I don't do that. So that's just kind of, I think part of about a uh, part of building good boundaries in your life Oh, hundred percent with people. And there, it's not that they're out of your life. They're there, but you've realized that you don't coexist well on a, on a all the time basis. So there's a boundary. Well, I mean, there might be somebody at work, for example, who, you know, this is a really good coworker, a really good colleague. I'm just probably not going to spend time personally one-on-one yeah. with this individual outside of work, but we can work together just but, fine. But I agree. Like I, I hate to watch people get steamrolled by yeah. others and just keep taking it and taking it and take, I think it's such a destructive thing to do and, and getting the, you know, being the nice guy that yeah. gets walked on. I think often throughout my life, I've been underestimated by people who think I'm going to allow that. Mm-hmm. And it's because of my, you know, I want to, I don't lash out. I don't explode. I don't fight. I don't get physical. You know, I don't yell. I just, I'm just firm and, yeah. and, and, uh, kind of that, you know, uh, it, it, so I don't know. I, I, I feel like I get underestimated a lot. So I spent a lot of my life going in a polite way. Sorry, this isn't going to fly. Yeah. And then they, it's like, they don't hear it. Right. <laughs> they just don't hear. They're used to hearing like the guy go off yeah. or scream at them like or one push spectrum, back or, one side of the spectrum yeah. or the other. And so when I say that, it's like, yeah, whatever. And then they keep going and yeah. they keep going until it's like, wait, he meant what he said. That's because nobody means what they say anymore. Like, wouldn't it be cool if everybody just told the truth? Like granted, I mean, there's certain times. Where That's what I said earlier know, when I was on your podcast. You did, but it's, you were so right. Tell the truth. Like, so here's a prime example. And here's an example that's always touchy for guys, especially when your wife comes to you and says, how do you like this outfit? My thought is like, I'm going to be honest with my wife. Like, I'm going to tell her, you know what? I don't, I don't like that outfit. I tell her that like if she, she stays at home and so she makes dinners and she likes doing that. And and she'll say, what do you think of this dinner? I'm like, it's it's not my favorite. (laughs) Yeah. I'm going to one up you here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here's my one up. This is important. Okay. My wife will come to me and say, look, does this dress make me look fat? And I'll be like, no, your fat makes you look fat. 
<laughs> I don't know if I'd take it that much. I, I really am like, do not ask a question if, if you want the truth. You know, I, I – and, and the same thing I get – I get – people get upset with me online because, of course, I'll say something about public lands or I'll say something yeah. about hunting. Yeah. I'll make a case for the ethical and morality of hunting and the scientific justification for hunting. Mm-hmm. I like to take a two-pronged approach. I think all hunters should be aware of it from a moral standpoint. Mm-hmm. Let's talk morals. Let's talk right and wrong. Yeah. Let's talk evil and, and good. At the same time. Let's also talk science yeah. as well and the scientific justification for how the world operates, right? And I'm not going to pussyfoot and I'm not going to pull the punches when it comes to that. I will be firm and direct and sometimes a little heated in my conversation with people. And I'll engage with someone online who says something that I disagree with mm-hmm. and I'll, ex- I'll exchange and I will say, like I said the other day, this this – this uh, argument that you're making, that you're proposing around bears and how to manage them lacks common sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. It doesn't take genius. Like common sense. Right. If you follow this Some basic understanding, this, your right. proposition to its end, end position, you can see that it's going to lead to a, a no win situation. It lacks common sense. Well, then people get mad because you're, you're like, you're jerk. insulted. You said he doesn't have common sense. Yeah. And I'm like, well, it doesn't. Right. This is not. A, this is not an attack. This is a statement. It's just a statement of a, of an, a truthful statement. Right. And so I try to be as truthful as possible. People don't like the truth. But People, there's a benefit, though. There is a benefit, and the benefit of being willing to offend somebody. And, and that's what it, you have to be willing mm-hmm. for people to be offended occasionally by what you say. Right. Because if you're trying to tap dance around like, oh, this person's feelings and what, I can you say this to this person. cannot have meaningful person. conversations no. without risk of offense. That's part, it's inherent right. in that conversation. And I love having conversations even with people that I disagree with. If they're emotionally intelligent enough to handle a disagreement without believing that I'm attacking them individually. Yeah. Right? Like, hey – you know, let's debate what public lands are. I, I happen to be on the same side of the fence as you when it comes to that. But if we were in disagreement, mm-hmm. I, w- I would hope that both of us are emotionally intelligent enough to uh, to be able to to have some discourse, yeah, some real conversation without oh he's attacking me, and then just completely shut down the conversation. I, I got to tell you, like people I admire, like I admire Joe Rogan mm-hmm. for for this reason here that Joe, as far as I can tell is always open Mm -hmm. to the idea that he could be wrong Mm -hmm. and that if new information is presented, he could, he'll actually shift his position. He'll feel, feel, he'll feel strongly one way, but he's, but he'll listen. He'll go, boom, new information. Wait a minute. I think I was wrong. Right. But people criticize that. And then they say it's wishy-washy. It's crazy. Not, it's, it's not. It's, 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 it's intelligence. It's intelligence. Right. right. He's exercising some intelligence. He's like, well, I used to think all these things, but now that I've heard right. this, and then he weighs all the body of evidence. Mm-hmm. And then he says, you know what? I was mistaken before. Based, based on my, what I see now before me, I'm going to take this position now. Mm-hmm. This is my new position. I think right there, that takes an intense amount of humility to, to do, to, 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 and, and, strength, and, a, and a desire right? for actually not, you know, ego has to get dropped because That's now true. you're like, I want truth. I, I want to figure More out I what to be right. Exactly. Yeah. And I feel Great like point. there's a few people that, that I see do that. And I see Joe do that often. You know, you can say whatever you want about Joe in his, in other areas of, of, of his, you know, beliefs and personality and such. But I like that about him. Yeah. I like that about a few other people I know. And so I want that characteristic. I want to sit there and go, okay, I can have a discussion with like Senator Mike Lee here in Utah and hear what he has to say for his justification for transferring right. federally managed lands to to, the, yeah. to, 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 to state trust lands. I, I, I'd like to think that I can sit down, have that conversation and hear him out, hear all of his reasons for that and then weigh it out. Right. And then go, okay, I can see the entire body of evidence and see if maybe I change my mind. So far, based on what I know, I feel like transferring federally managed land into state control would be a, a colossal mistake. Mm-hmm. And so I I am against it and I'm vocal about it. And 
But like I said, I would like to be the person. Uh, my, my ideal is, is to be the person that can take on new information and perhaps change. Like no doors are closed. The challenge with that is you need to find somebody else who's willing to do that as well. Right? Because if there's two parties at the table and you happen to be the one that's rational, the other person's like, I'm not changing my stance I'm here to win. I'm here happens. to win an argument. Then there's nothing you can do. I mean, you, you know can't who I see really do this too. Though. In that conversation, Jordan B. Peterson does it. Mm-hmm. Like, like where he seems genuinely interested in the truth, not about being right. He does, and if you hear him talk, to me, when I hear him talk, it sounds like I imagine he thinks. So what I mean is that he's thinking as he's talking, like he's playing out scenarios in his mind. Like you can almost Mm -hmm. see him thinking through what he's saying, Yep. which to me indicates somebody that's really questioning whether what they're saying is true or not and accurate. Exactly. And I think if you're, if you're in that position where you're like, okay, tell the truth. Like I said before, Mm -hmm. if you're really, if your goal is to really speak the truth in every situation that you can, then it's not about whether you're right or wrong, whether you're winning the argument. It's it's about the truth, mm-hmm. right? And so it kind of guides. It's an over it's a overarching principle that can guide a conversation. So you might be in that conversation where the other person does not care about that. Mm-hmm. They just want to win their argument. They just want to be the winner. They have a lot of ego wrapped up in it. You can have that discussion, but you're often when I engage, I engage in those conversations. I engage in conversations with that type of person on a daily basis. Oh yeah. Happens all the time. And especially through social media, especially when I put a bear film out called consuming life and I shoot a bear, right? I'm going to get those conversations. People are going to write in and say, how you're such a filthy human being. Cause you, you murder bears, which is part of the, I mean, part of kind of the objective to like, let's, let's have some dialogue. Like like, let's make this a little edgy so we can talk about this stuff. So when we sit down and we have this conversation and we go into it and we dive into it and I'm with that person, I know they're there to win an argument. Mm -hmm. Most of the time they're not there to get at any kind of truth or reality. They are not, they have an ideology that they're, that they stand behind that they identify with and what they feel makes them who they are. I still engage in that conversation and I'm still trying to listen to what they have to say. And I try to put myself in that position of, being willing to learn and perhaps even change my own situation, if my own position, if something new comes to the table, that would allow that. At the same time, I also know that I'm never. They're coming from a position where they're never going to change their mind. They, they're they're not at least without some kind of deep crisis right. yeah, some, to to, yeah. to reset the 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 situation. But at the same time, you know what? I'm not having that discussion with that person for that person. Right. That's a good point. I don't care about changing that person's point of view, but there's 1000 people that have been looking at that exchange and they're wondering the same thing that person is, but they're coming at it from a truth seeking position, but they feel a lot like what this idea, uh, ideal, uh, ideological human is, is thinking they, 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 they really identify with that person. My interaction with them is is to help that person from the outside, the spectator that's watching that conversation. Yeah. So I'll get a message from someone that says, Brian, why are you bothering with this person? I'm not, it's not it's about like, that. It's not that person. It's all the people who s- observe that exchange. And I have to believe that, you know, earlier you asked me when I was on your podcast, which I highly recommend everybody go check out your podcast not just the one I just did. Just that one. That's, but, that's the only, that's, Just that one. I sh- when you asked me what was my favorite podcast, <laughs> I should have said the one we just did. You that's failed. That's what you were looking for. That's funny. No, uh, <laughs> you asked me, and I'm going to ask you this, like, what, what's, what, is, what does it mean to be a man? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've thought a lot about, obviously, this question. And, and I, I want to tell you, like, before you go on, I kind of want to retract what I said. Okay. I like what I said. I think it was right. But there's I agree. there's another thing. Like, what does it mean to be a man? And the first thing that popped in my head before I before I said what I said, and if people want to figure that out, they gotta go listen to your show. But the first thing that popped in my head was, you know, as a man, like provide responsibility. Yeah. Like that really like popped in like firmly. Um but then, you know, went down this other road, which I think they tie together, but I do think that responsibility is 
is what it means to be a man. And going back to stealing some stuff from Jordan B. Peterson, like 12 rules for life. Mm -hmm. He says, you know, you have two options in this life, right? You can have no responsibility and you can have no meaning. Mm. They go hand in hand. Yeah. Oh yeah. No purpose. Or you can have purpose, meaning, and responsibility. You can't have them. You can't have meaning without responsibility. Without because yeah, that's a good point. because it, if if this thing that we're doing here, me and you, if it matters, if it has meaning, then then I have a responsibility. Right. There's some obligation. Everything that comes out of my mouth matters. Everything I do matters. My actions matter. My my being matters. But you know what? If it doesn't matter, who gives a damn what we say? Right. Or what we do. Or whether we show up here today or tomorrow. there's a lot of people that feel that way. Why don't we just go party? Yeah. Why don't we just lie? Why don't we just steal some stuff? Why don't we just take and take and take? So to me, I I, I went back to thinking about it after we got done earlier I'll take today. This component of our conver- of this conversation and put it in that one because <laughs> I went back to the house and I was like, "What is it? What does it mean to be a man?" And I and I was thinking, and I kept couldn't shake that responsibility part. And I thought, you know what? Responsibility, taking on responsibility because you believe that there's meaning in your existence. To me, that's what it means to be, to be a man. I'm, I'm in a hundred percent agreement. I mean, I, I look at, so there's a couple, a couple of different elements for this, you know, specifically the roles that we play. And I think in our, in our, our motto happens to be, which is not just a motto for me. It's the way I choose to live my life is that a man is somebody who protects, he provides and he presides. And that's what I think. Now you look at and break down each one of those elements, protection, provision, and, and, uh, presiding. What do they have? Responsibility, significance, purpose, meaning, service of other people, right? Protecting yourself, those that you care about, those that who cannot protect themselves, providing for not just financially, but uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and then preside as leadership, leadership mm-hmm. in your home over, over your children, leadership in, in conjunction with your wife. Um, leadership in the community. If you're running a business leadership for the people who are listening to this podcast, um, all of those things. And I look at the difference between, cause one, I, I made a video on, on YouTube and I, and I said eight, eight skill sets, every man must master. And one of the common comments that I get on YouTube, which I should never <laughs> ever go on the YouTube comments is always, well, I have a penis, so I'm a man. And I'm like, that's not true because my boys, <laughs> have male anatomy, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't consider them men. Right. They're boys. It takes significantly more than your anatomy to call yourself a man and it's responsibility. It's accountability. And it's the ability to be a protector, a provider and a leader in the things that you're responsible for. I like it. It's well, that's a deep. little more polished it's manly. Cause I, cause I've thought a lot about, it. <laughs> well, <laughs> what about this? Like in the world of social, social justice warriors that we, that we, uh, live in today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your podcast gets accused of being patriarchal and sexist. Yeah. Misogynistic, patriarchal (laughs) at times. Um, you know, and, and well, first of all, patriarch, that's not a bad word. It just means that the, the, that the male members of the community are passing down their knowledge to future generations. Oh, that's a beautiful thing. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. And I get that, but you know what? It, it, cause you're also perpetuating or reinforcing an idea of, of, you know, what it means to be a man, you know, you have this world of gender neutral. Let's yeah. not, let's let our kids decide what gender they are. Right. Let's not give them any direction. Let's give them Barbie dolls. If they're a guy and if she's a gal, give her a gun yeah. you know, to play with. Yeah. And even though they may not want to. Right. And let's, let's encourage this sort of like, let's let them flounder in what they are and I what mean, it means dir- to be a man sh- or a woman. Showing direction and guidance and, and, and and learning these things is important. It's valuable. We need to teach our children these things, these parameters in which we operate and frameworks in which they can make their own decisions. Yeah. Right. That, that stuff's good. Um, yeah, you know, I, the way I look at it is if anybody attacks manliness, masculinity, that is simultaneously attack on women and femininity. Because if you're trying to make everybody the same, you strip away all of the great things that make men, men and all of the beautiful and wonderful things that make women women. 
it's okay that we're different. We're different in so many ways. This is scientific. This is uh, just visibly noticeable. Like Common sense. Exactly, right? And, and so if you say, well, men shouldn't behave this way, then you're also saying, well, then women shouldn't bring their strengths to the table. And look, there's times where women can certainly exhibit masculine characteristics. They can exhibit strength and fortitude and grit and res- I know, I know some, my, my mother, mm-hmm. she, my wife, Yeah, they, they can exhibit all of those things. And at the same time, I can exhibit feminine characteristics at time, love, kindness, compassion, nurturing. empathy, nurturing. Those are generally feminine characteristics. That's not to say I'm a woman or a woman who decides to be more masculine because perhaps she's chasing a, a career uh, mm-hmm. endeavor is a man. Mm-hmm. She just utilizing different characteristics and traits in order to accomplish desired objectives. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But we're still men and women. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. No, we're, we're on the same page there. I think it's a, I, you know, as a big fan of Jordan Peterson and, um, his, his battle that he's waged in, you know, the, in Canadian law, even Mm -hmm. with compelled speech laws. Right. Yeah. And how, and how uh, gender fluid people and gender neutral people and so forth should be referred to in different ways when, when he's like, no, a man is a man, a woman is a man, woman. It's simple. It's clear. It's how we have navigated for eons. It's, and it's, and it works, you know, mm-hmm. it works. Like I hear these things like, oh, traditional gender roles. Well, why do you think they've evolved that way? Why, why do you think they become so normal and, and dare I say stereotypical that people begin to recognize them. Well, it's probably because they've worked. Yeah. They've produced effective outcomes for both men and women. That's not to say we can't uh, figure out new ways of doing things, but so there are certain things that don't change. And look, if, if a guy, if a man wants to call himself a woman, oh, okay, that doesn't mean I have to acknowledge that. Yeah. I, I, from my perspective on a lot of these things, I'm very libertarian. It's mm-hmm. like you choose how right. you want to be. Fine. Like, dude, you do you. It's weird to me, but cool. Yeah. Go for it. I, I'm not going to impede on your decision to do that. The only time I, I get in, I would get involved in something like that is when it affects a human life. Right. You know, when you start going down a road where, uh, where like, for example, abortion is something where, mm-hmm. you know, it's a heated topic, but but now we're, we're, we're moving into an area where there's a third life, the baby yeah, you know, that, that has to be considered like you do you mm-hmm. except here, right? Where it's like, well, now it's, a now muddled. you're affecting another. Yeah. And, and there's other, there's other elements of this, you know, when, when you start talking about these, these gender, you know, quote unquote gender identities and things. And, and now they're wanting to introduce them into the school system. And so your children now have the potential to learn these things as being more normalized, you know, yeah, that, I'm going to raise some red flags on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know that the, 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 the state should necessarily be involved in the educational process anyways, but that's a whole other conversation. Right. Right. That's a very interesting topic, but yeah, I feel like, um, you know, I grew up in a household where, um, with where both my mother and my father uh, are extremely dominant. Like my mom, especially she is a, a she'll rip your head off. I mean, she, she had to, she had a lot of kids, um, strong willed, yeah, very strong willed. And honestly, without her being the intense human that she is, uh, a lot of us would have maybe would not be here today. Mm -hmm. You know, she helped us, you know, uh, she is like no, no man left behind. That is kind of her motto. It doesn't matter which kid they're all going to make it. They're all going to, they're all going to get there and it didn't matter what it took, you know? And so that's an extreme to me, that's an extreme, uh, level of nurturing and care that, and responsibility, mm-hmm. like everything she does, you know, to her, everything mattered, you know, and that's, that's how we all have all my siblings and I have, have come to where we are today. And it's because of those, those parents and their, those gender roles that they, yeah. that they played. Um, and, and there's so much satisfaction in when well, you talk about responsibility, there's so much satisfaction and responsibility. Like so many people take, they spend so much time running away from it and avoiding it. And I hear guys are like, you know, at work, they're like, well, my boss asked me if I'd take on this role, but he's not going to pay me more. Screw that. I'm not going to do that. I'm like, what an opportunity you just passed up. Mm-hmm. 
you know, not, not only a financially incentivized opportunity, but just an opportunity to like give your, your life a little bit more purpose and direction. And yeah. Uh, What do you think about this where people, I've noticed that much of where I'm at today with the podcast and, and the platform I'm building in this brand gritty is a result of, of, uh, me willing to do a lot with nothing, no expectation in return. Like, um, well, I, th I think, I, you know, I, I, that's hard to say, but I guess it depends on what that expectation would be. Right. Like, like, is it, is it financially motivated? Maybe. And I, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong mm -hmm. with that. Um, but if it brings you some sorts of, uh, some sorts of satisfaction, then maybe that is the incentive. You know, like I, I think in order for us to do something, there always has to be something that's propelling and motivating us to do it. It just may be defined differently by different people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, someone might not want to do anything because they're not financially incentivized. That's their prerogative. But there's other things that I enjoy in life just simply for the pure satisfaction and enjoyment that, that comes with it. I, yeah. And there's definitely that, or I wouldn't have done it with, right. without that. <sighs> I, w I would have done it whether I was getting paid or not. Right. I think the but, world places so much emphasis on successful means financially successful. To me, success means autonomy. And autonomy is being able to do what you want, when you want, why you want. Right. And that's the only accurate answer to that question. What does success mean? It means autonomy. Meaning I can't define it for you. Mm -hmm. You can't define it for me. We have to define it for ourselves. Yeah. I like that. I've noticed people who I, I look at and I'm like, man, man, if they just would forget about what's in it for me, mm. they could have the world in, in their hands. Yeah. Zig Ziglar said, if you help enough people get what they want, you inevitably get what it is you want. Exactly. Something that's what I'm saying. Lines. Like, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. It's like, quit worrying about if you're getting your fair shake right. or if you're getting uh, all the things you want out of this deal. Quit worrying about that. Yeah. Just, just help other people. Right. You know, uh, Gary V is one of those people I really love Gary Vaynerchuk. And, um, uh, he wrote that book, crush it. And he, then he wrote the thank you economy. Mm -hmm. And then he wrote, uh, you know, like jab, 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 yeah, jab right, jab, right, hook, right yeah. hook, you know? And it was like, give, 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 ask, you know? And I really learned, I, I kind of modeled a lot of what I did in the beginning around, this concept of the law of reciprocation, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to go give, 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 and just do things that I think are going to make people happy, make them laugh, uh, entertain them, but also help them l learn new things. And, and I'm going to learn along the way too. Yeah. And we're going to do this together. together. And by the time I'm done, these people are going to like it and they're going to be thankful and they'll take care of me in return. They'll support what I do. And so that's, that's kind of where I went. And I went forth like that, but I also fully acknowledge maybe, maybe they don't, maybe they don't give back mm -hmm. and it's just me. Give, 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 give. What's the worst that could happen? Well, I gave a lot. Right. And in the course of that, I grew a lot. You, and you learned a lot. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just to shoot straight with you here is like in the financial planning practice, um, I was, I was moderately successful. We'll call it that. I was moderately successful with my financial planning practice, but I was helping people with their money and getting their financial situations in order. But there was just always something a little bit off. Like I, I felt like I, I don't know if I couldn't ever fully get behind it yeah. or what it was. I was out serving and helping and making an income. And I'll tell you what, man, over the past three and a half years, being involved in order of man and the movement that we're creating here is... I find so much more value individually, like what I'm able to add to people's lives. Like there's so much more meaning and significance and I have poured my heart and my soul and my energy and my resources into serving men around the world. And at the same time, I've never made more money in my entire life than I have now. Like it's a natural principle that the more that you do something that serves other people in a way that's significant for you, you will inevitably receive out of that deal as well. I like it. I like it. Did you just, Instagram I just Instagram storied you live Jeez, right man, there. That's Boom. A, that's intense, that? man. That Two cameras. Intense. Live podcast. 
I was like, what's he doing? Is he taking <laughs> taking stills or is he taking video over That's here? That's right, video. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we should probably wrap up, but, uh, you know, if someone's coming along and they're checking out the Order of a Man podcast, uh, give me give me like three episodes that that you are you'd like for them to start with. Um, there's one called it's a so I do I do a Tuesday interview show and then I do a Friday field notes where it's just me kind of rambling for for half an hour or so. Uh, there's one I just did. I don't know what episode number it is, but you can look it up. It's called uh, Fix Your Marriage by Fixing Yourself. And whether you're married or not, or whether your your marriage is struggling or not, that the premise in that episode will, if you adopt it and utilize it in your life, will transform every facet of your life. So yeah. fix your marriage by fixing yourself. Uh, definitely check out the Jocko. The second the second interviews, I, I think is better. Not not by anything he did, but like, but me, I yeah. got, I got better. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's that's a really good show. Um, and then your show. <laughs> I was supposed to say that, right? Bam. <laughs> uh, you besides mine. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tim Kennedy was a really good episode. Tim Kennedy. Do you know Tim Kennedy? Uh-uh. Uh, no. he's an army, uh, green beret ranger, uh, U- for- former UFC fighter. He retired. Um, he's all over discovery channel. I mean, the guy is just, he's insane. <laughs> like in a good way. Yeah. He's insane. And on the episode, he talked about um, man's responsibility to be a sheepdog. Are you familiar with yes. the sheepdog? Yeah. Yep. So man's responsibility to be a sheepdog. And that was really enlightening and eye-opening to me coming from an individual who I admire and respect. And, you know, I think to in order to be successful at any level, you kind of got to be a little weird, right? Like you got to be an outlier. Oh, yeah. And he, Jocko, Jocko's not Jocko, normal. Right. That's what I'm saying. You know, and you're not I, saying it in a negative way, but there's something different and unique and weird and odd about the people who always rise to the top. Trump. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Exactly, yeah. Uh, but Jocko's like that. Tim Kennedy's like that. Mm-hmm. Cam Haynes, who we've talked right. about, is like yeah, that. It's just unnatural. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, those. But anyways, there's a couple episodes you can check out. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. All right, folks. Anything else? Any closing comments? No, man. Yeah. I, I've enjoyed it. We, I, we've I, talked for like three hours. Yeah, I know. I've enjoyed both these conversations and uh, just just looking forward to getting to know you better. Yeah. Greatly, greatly appreciate you coming on the show today. All right, folks, thanks for listening to Gritty. Stay gritty. Despite our ever-changing, ever-indignant world with its growing ignorance of and indifference to the ways of the wild, I remain a predator, pitying those who revel in artificiality and synthetic success while regarding me and my kind as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood. I stalk a real world of dark wood and tall grass stirred by a restless wind blowing across sunlit water and beneath star-strewn sky. And on those occasions when I choose to kill, to claim some small part of nature's bounty for my own, I do so by choice, quickly, with the learned efficiency of a skilled hunter. Further in my heart and mind, I know the truth and make no apologies for my actions or my place in time. Others around me may opt to eat only plants, nuts, and fruits. Still others may employ faceless strangers to procure their meats, their leather, their feathers, and all those niceties and necessities of life. Such is their right, of course, and I wish them well. All I ask in return is no one begrudge me, and all of us who may answer the primordial stirrings within our hunter's souls, my right to do some of these things myself. What you just heard is a quote from M.R. James. We truly live in a world that is largely ignorant and indifferent to the ways of the wild. And although some regard us as relics of a time and place no longer valued or understood, we have the opportunity to change the way these people view the hunter and the hunt. We can share our experiences and nature's bounty with those who employ these faceless strangers. And by so doing, we make a difference, not just for ourselves, but for the wild animals in the wild places we care so deeply about. Never stop sharing your passion for hunting and the outdoors. Our wild animals and our wild places depend on it. This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>